ten twenty, so it's four twenty somewhere. If you got one, spark up. All right. Part 12 of the uh, When Will Jesus Bring the Pork Chops audiobook by George Carlin. Let's get to it. Back 10 seconds from the last one. Better bargain than the chicken with stars. I say know what you want, get what you need, and get the fuck out of there. That's how you shop. Hello there, I'm a cockroach. Listen, I'm gonna keep this to a minimum because I gotta get back to the kitchen and eat a bunch of crumbs that I spotted on the table. Plus, there's a little puddle of gravy on the left side of the sink near the drain that nobody noticed. Okay, here's my deal. Bug sprays. We don't like them, we don't need them, we don't want them. We say get rid of them, okay? That's it. Otherwise, if you don't do what we want, we're gonna crawl all over your face while you're asleep. We'll even go up your nose. We don't care. Thanks. I'll see you later. And for Christ's sakes, turn out the lights, will you please? When I'm on a commercial flight and I see a fly flying down the center of the airplane from back to front, I like to take him off to one side and ask him if he understands how fast he's moving. They never really know. So the first thing I do is briefly explain Newton's laws of motion, complete with a small diagram to make it a bit easier. But the only thing their little fly egos are interested in is how fast they're moving. So I tell them that in order to calculate their velocity relative to the ground, all they have to do is add their own flying speed to the speed of the airplane. I show them how it works, and they can't believe it when they discover that they're actually traveling over 500 miles an hour. The first thing most of them mention is that a frog's tongue wouldn't stand a chance against that kind of speed. Here's a small sampling of embarrassing societal cliches that I find tiresome, and in some cases, just plain ignorant. If it saves just one life. You often hear a new policy or procedure justified by the specious idea that if it saves the life of just one, and in there you insert child or American soldier, it'll be worth it. Well, maybe not. I think they're saying that about the, uh, the Fauci ouchy or the Fauci juice that New York City has now mandated everyone get or else you can't go inside nowhere even if you have a medical disability that prevents you from getting that shit. I tell you, I wish George was still alive today. We need George. Maybe a closer look would show that the cost in time, money, or inconvenience would be much too high to justify merely saving one life. What's wrong with looking at it like that? Governments and corporations make those calculations all the time. Every child is special. An empty and meaningless statement. What about every adult? Isn't every adult special? And if not, then at what age does a person go from being special to being not so special? And if every adult is also special, then that means all people are special, and the idea has no meaning. This embarrassing sentiment is usually advanced to further some position that is either political or fundraising in nature. It's similar to, children are our future. It's completely meaningless and is probably being used in some self-serving way. After the death of some person, even many years after, you'll often hear someone refer to the deceased by saying, I get the feeling he's up there now, smiling down on us, and I think he's pleased. I actually heard this when some dead coach's son was being inducted into the Football Hall of Fame. First of all, it's extremely doubtful that there's any up there to smile down from. It's poetic, and I guess it's comforting, but it probably doesn't exist. Besides, if a person did somehow survive death in a non-physical form, he would be far too busy with other things to be smiling down on people. And why is it we never hear that someone is smiling up at us? 
I suppose it doesn't occur to people that a loved one might be in hell. And in that case, the person in question probably wouldn't be smiling. More likely, he'd be screaming. I get the feeling he's down there now, screaming up at us. And I think he's in pain. People just refuse to be realistic. This puts everything in perspective. This nonsense often crops up after some unexpected sports death, like that of Cardinals pitcher Daryl Kyle. After one of these athletes' sudden death, one of his dopey teammates will say, this really puts everything in perspective. And I say, listen, putz, if you need someone to die in order to put things in perspective, you got problems. You ain't paying enough attention. America's lost innocence. I keep hearing that America lost its innocence on 9-11. I thought that happened when JFK was shot. Or was it Vietnam? Or Pearl Harbor? How many times can America lose its innocence? Maybe we keep finding it again. Doubtful. Because actually, if you look at the record, you'll find that America has had very little innocence from the beginning. Let the healing begin. This bothersome sentiment is usually heard following some large-scale killing or accident that's been overreported in the news, like Columbine, Oklahoma City, or the World Trade Center. It's often accompanied by another meaningless, overworked cliché, closure. People can't seem to get it through their heads that there is never any healing or closure, ever. There is only a short pause before the next horrifying event. People forget there's such a thing as memory, and that when a wound heals, it leaves a permanent scar that never goes away, but merely fades a little. What really ought to be said after one of these so-called tragedies is, let the scarring begin. Just trying to be helpful here. We're Consolidated International, and we might be looking for you. Are you one of those submissive people who show up, punch in, put out, pitch in, punch out, clean up, head home, throw up, turn in, sack out, and shut up? That's what we need. People we can keep in line. We just might have a place for you. Consolidated International. People making things so people have things to do things to other people with. I hope all of you good, loyal Americans understand that in the long run, the Islamist extremists are going to win because you can't beat numbers. And you can't beat fanaticism, the willingness to die for an idea. A country like ours, preoccupied with jet skis, off-road vehicles, snowboards, jacuzzis, microwave ovens, pornography, lap dances, massage parlors, escort services, panty liners, penis enhancement, tummy tucks, thongs, and odor eaters, doesn't have a prayer, not even a good old-fashioned Christian prayer, against a billion fanatics who hate that country, detest its materialism, and have nothing really to lose. Maybe 50 years ago, but not today, when germs and chemicals and nuclear materials are for sale everywhere. People who don't give a shit and have nothing to lose will always prevail over people who are fighting for some vague sentiment scrawled on a piece of parchment. Folks, they're gonna get you, and it ain't gonna be pleasant. We can't drop a 5,000 pound bomb on every one of them. They will either run all over us, or in trying, they will turn us into even bigger monsters than we already are. And don't get all excited about this goofy idea of the spread of democracy. No matter who the United States puts in charge to bring peace and order in Iraq or Palestine or anywhere else, those people will be killed. It's that simple. Anyone who supports the United States will be killed. Peace and order will not be tolerated. Start saving your cash for the black market, folks. You're going to need it. <clears throat> so, yeah. The withdrawal from Afghanistan just happened. And, uh... It was a much-needed withdrawal. We needed to get out. However, um, I think the Taliban could sense that our president is demented and weak, and uh, had absolutely no problem waiting zero time at all. You know, what he said, it won't happen Friday to Monday, it happened 
Friday or Monday. Less than that, actually. But, yeah. Um, I don't know. But, I mean, and then, given the Afghan papers that came out in the Washington Post and the, uh, the Afghan war log uh, release in WikiLeaks, they knew long ago that Afghanistan would never stand on its own, that it would fall to the Taliban the second we left. Um, however, I don't know. It, it's a tough one, but let's get back to it. Channel 7 recognizes its obligation to provide equal time to viewers who disagree with its editorial policy. Here then, with an editorial reply, is Dr. Stephen Wenker, a clinical psychologist. Dr. Wenker speaks as a private citizen. Thank you. Are these Channel 7 people kidding? Huh? What kind of crap are they trying to pull? Did you hear that shit they said last week about the budget? Jesus Christ, I couldn't believe it. What kind of assholes do they think we are? And they were always acting so self-righteous, like they know what's good for us and we're too stupid to think. I get tired listening to this shit. How about you, huh? Fuck these people. Who do they think they are with their goddamn three-piece suits and their fancy eyeglasses? And by the way, you know how long it takes to get one of these goddamn editorial replies on the air? Three fucking years! Three years ago I started asking to do this shit. They kept saying, well, we're not sure you're stable enough to be allowed on the air. And I said, stable? What are you fucking people, crazy? I'm as stable as the next cocksucker. I said to him, bend over and I'll give you something stable. Fortunately, they were able to recognize the logic of my argument, and here I am. But you know what I found out these assholes can do? They can cut you off the air if they want to. For instance, if they don't like what you're saying, they can just fucking enter... That was Stephen Wanker, a clinical psychologist. <laughs> Tune in to Channel 7 tomorrow night for another editorial reply, as schoolteacher Howard Boudreau delivers an opinion titled... Oh, which... Which one was it? That just happened. I want to say it was CNN. I know CNN's famous for doing it, where they'll, as soon as someone starts talking off of the talking points, they magically lose connection anytime someone starts telling some truths that aren't supposed to be told. That, that was, that hit the spot. What's all this phony bullshit about drunk driving? And later in the week, don't miss Mayor Cosmo Drelling as he addresses another important issue, what's so bad about slavery? Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We now join Blowjobs of the Rich and Famous in progress. And later this evening, tune in Dr. Jim as he removes a wart from a lesbian. I'm always glad when some group of American hostages is released overseas and they finally get to come home to their families. I'm not glad because I particularly care about them, but because I get sick of hearing about them on TV. And I get sick of listening to their families. Jesus, did I get tired of all those whining hostage families during that bullshit in Iran in the 1970s. My husband's a hostage. The government's not doing enough. Hey, lady, if you don't want your husband to be a hostage, tell him to stay the fuck out of Iran or places like it in the first place. It's a simple thing. You don't have to be a theoretical physicist to figure it out. If you stay out of those places, you got a good chance of not becoming a hostage. And the media always refers to them as innocent Americans. Bullshit. There are no innocent Americans. And whatever they are, they're certainly not news. First thing you know, once they're back, they start writing books one by one, and you have to endure the whole thing all over again, seeing them on every talk show, regurgitating the whole fucking boring story again. And here are some more families I'm not interested in. Astronauts' families. Who cares about these people? Astronauts' wives and children. They're not news. Keep them off TV. I don't even care about the astronauts themselves. Anal retentive robots wasting money in space. And, not incidentally, spreading our foul, grotesquely distorted DNA beyond this biosphere. I say keep the infection local. God, haven't we done enough damage on this planet? Now we're going to go somewhere else and leave our filth and garbage all over the universe? Jesus, what a fucking pack of idiots we are. Thank you. 
Here's a little scene between two Irish guys in New York. Boy, a lot has changed in 20 years. Yeah. Is Norton still around? Frankie? No, Jimmy. Jimmy's dead. And Frankie died at the funeral. They're both dead. What about Bobby? How's he? He's dead, too. A lot of them are dead. What was the other Norton kid's name? Tommy? Is he dead? No. Tommy's not dead. Thank God for that. He's dying. Jeez, his mother must be heartbroken. The mother was killed in a boiler explosion. Blown to pieces. Jeez. I'll never forget that house the Nortons lived in, you know? Kind of a cute place with little green shutters. Hit by lightning 15 years ago. Burned to the ground. All the pets were killed. Jeez. That's too bad. I remember the Nortons always liked that house because it was so close to the church. A lady of perpetual suffering? Yeah, yeah. The church is gone. Condemned by the city last year and demolished on Good Friday. So where did the neighborhood kids go to school? Most of the neighborhood kids were killed a few years ago by a rapist who worked at the grocery store. Dorians? No, Babingtons. I like Dorians. They always had good produce. Dorians collapsed 10 years ago and killed 19 customers. The entire Halloran family was decapitated at the butcher counter while they were picking out meat. Jeez, times really change. Well, life goes on. I think the warning labels on alcoholic beverages are too bland. They should be more vivid. Here are a few I'd suggest. Alcohol will turn you into the same asshole your father was. Drinking will significantly improve your chances of murdering a loved one. If you drink long enough, at some point you will vomit up the lining of your stomach. Use this product and you may wake up in Morocco wearing a cowboy suit and tongue-kissing a transmission salesman. <laughs> Men, when emptying your pockets after a night of using this product, you may come across a human finger, a wad of Turkish money, and a snapshot of a naked ex-convict named Dog Meat. The photo will be inscribed, To Dave, my new old lady. Women, drink enough of this, and you'll spend the rest of your life raising malnourished children in a rusting trailer with a man who sleeps all day. Except for the rapes. Newspaper death notices could also be written more honestly. Have you seen the lies they print? Cherished and beloved husband of Kathleen, devoted and esteemed father of Thomas, loving brother of Edward. Bullshit. Let's be realistic. Ryan, James D., jealous and abusive husband of Kate, lustful, wanton father of Maureen, controlling and manipulative father of Matthew, cruel, envious, and conniving brother of Thomas, died yesterday to the great relief of the family. May he burn a long time in the worst parts of the deepest pits of the hottest precincts of hell. It is good to have him out of our lives. Funeral at the Church of the Holy Bleeding Wounds, Burial in Crown of Thorns Cemetery. No flowers. Donations should be made in cash directly to the family for purposes of celebration. This realistic idea could spread. It might even inspire young men to make more realistic marriage proposals. Honey, let's get married. I, I realize I'm asking you to take a chance on a proven loser. I mean, I don't have any money or stuff like that. But maybe, hear me out, hear me out, please. Maybe we could find a cheap, unclean apartment in a dangerous neighborhood and have more kids than we can afford. If we're lucky, maybe a few of them won't be born sickly and disfigured in spite of our genetic histories. Meanwhile, I could find a dehumanizing, low-paying, dead-end job with no benefits while you stay home watching TV and gaining weight. And if things get bad, like if I get paralyzed and you get raped by Mexican sailors and lose your mind and start crying all the time, we can always move in with my parents. They love kids, and their incest counseling is almost complete. And I've noticed Dad's episodes are starting to result in far less property damage than they used to. What do you say, honey? Want to give it a shot? Maybe our second set of HIV tests will turn up negative. <laughs> if I may renew a theme I spoke to earlier, I have a bit more to say about early boarding on the airlines. It's not just favoritism to the disabled that bothers me. That's unfair enough. 
But immediately after the various cripples, limpers, and wheelchair jockeys have been unfairly allowed to board early, the airline then has the nerve to allow people with children to get on the plane. Once again, at the expense of the rest of us. I do not understand this policy at all. Why should people board early simply because they have children? What's so special about having kids? After all, a lot of kids are accidents. Many people wind up with children simply because they're unlucky. Is that something we should be rewarding? I don't think being careless in bed should qualify someone for special treatment on an airplane. And by the way, as with the devious methods of the cane and crutch crowd mentioned earlier, I think there are some couples who bring their kids along on a trip solely for the purpose of early boarding. What other reason would you have for including kids on a trip? Enjoyment? Hardly. In fact, and this may seem extreme to some, it's my conviction that there are some couples who have intentionally gotten married and had families specifically for the purpose of getting on the plane early. I know it sounds unlikely to you, but don't forget, these are cold, pragmatic, striving, yuppie boomers. Unsentimental people who largely regard children as props and commodities anyway. Honey, let's have a kid so we can board planes early. Great idea, Scott. You start making a list of preschools and I'll get the lubricating jelly. Believe me, it happens more than you may think. So during this pre-flight, pre-boarding fiasco, after the crippled and the maimed have been safely strapped in, the airline people tell us they will now pre-board passengers traveling with small children. Well, that's fine as far as it goes, but what about passengers traveling with large children? Suppose you have a six-month-old son with a growth hormone disorder, one of those seven-foot infants with oversized heads that you see in the National Enquirer. Actually, with a kid like that, I think you'd be better off checking him in at the curb, don't you? He'd probably enjoy it in the luggage compartment. It's dark in there. I would imagine he's used to that. But I digress. Forgive me for indulging my weakness for flights of colorful narration. Back to the real problem. People with children on airplanes. Here's how you solve this. You make the following announcement. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a pre-boarding announcement only. We would like to address those of you who, both today and in your lives generally, find yourself burdened with needy and annoying children. We sympathize with you, but as long as you've decided to drag them along with you to Pittsburgh, we wish to minimize the inconvenience of their presence to the rest of us. Here is what is going to happen. First of all, you're getting on last, if there's room. Before that, we're going to board the full-grown humans and allow them to settle in, get comfortable, and have a drink or two. You may be standing out here for an hour or more. Then, you and your children will be swiftly escorted onto the aircraft and placed in a special soundproof walled-off area in the rear of the plane. There will be standing room only. For safety purposes, you will be tethered to one another and secured to the wall with leashes and straps. More than likely, there will not be any food left for you, but your children will be allowed to scavenge the trays of those passengers who did not finish their meals. Aside from that food service, you will be left alone and expected to keep the children quiet. And now, we ask that you please gather your precious creatures around you, and when you hear the whistle, see to it that they move smartly and swiftly onto the plane, remaining quiet and avoiding any eye contact with grown-ups. Thank you for flying the friendly skies of Sensible Airlines. Oh, that's a good spot to stop right there. Some of the, uh, is one tangent about the, um, you know, large kids or, yeah, the large kids. I've heard that one before, but that last, the ending to it was something I hadn't heard before, and that was, that was good. This was part 12. I don't want Jesus bring the pork chops. We are... Let's see. I think we are officially... Yeah. We're a little bit past the halfway point. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So. 12 parts down. 12 to go. Um. Links to my uh, political and my 420 merch will be in the description. Um, comment any suggestions you have. Uh, 
other than that, y'all have a nice night. Stay blazing. Thanks for watching.